you that really it's wonderful to see all of you here and we're so happy to have you visit with us and, and we're just we're just thrilled to have your presence here tonight we hope you enjoy the evening i was asked to give you a brief history of our operation here and i will i will try to be pretty brief but uh, our family's been here since 1839 that was six years before texas became a state when my great great grandfather came here and he married a woman hey, who John was here, did. and they had served, they had four sons together. And one of those sons was a guy named Josiah Dawson Hudgens, J. D. Hudgens. And J. D. Hudgens started a business in 1908 with his four children to raise cattle and farm. Hey, and they again. Raising cattle and saw the need for cattle that were more tropically adapted and cattle that could live better in this environment. And so they actually began searching for a breed of cattle that would live here efficiently in the hot weather. And they noticed that any time they saw some cattle that had a little hump and were short haired and had a little ear on them, those cattle did really well and they started really trying to put together all that they could. They were in the commercial cattle business. But in about 1915, they purchased a set of half Melor females from the Pierce Ranch. Now the Pierce Ranch had made the importation of cattle from India in 1906. And they bought daughters of those imported cattle. And then as they began breeding these cattle, they were constantly looking for a bull. And in those days, it was not like today we'd get on the internet or look through a magazine and find ads and go look at bulls. It was a little bit harder to find a good Brahmin bull. So they were constantly trying different bulls. But finally, in 1932, a lady came and met with my grandfather, Walter, and said she had this really good Brahmin bull and she needed another one when he trade her bulls. And so he sent her home and told her to send that bull to the packer and to bring the money back and he'd help her find a really good bull. She was so insistent that the bull was too good to send the slaughter that she came back a year later though and, and said, you've got to come look at this bull. And he drove down to Francitas, which is down toward Victoria and looked at the bull and was so taken by that bull that he traded her five bulls for that bull and that bull was Manso. Now somewhere in the crowd is Dr. Carlos Bono. Carlos, where are you? Right here. Right here. Dr. Bono, we never knew who this lady who this lady was except she was Mrs. Gale. And we just found out in the last few years that the lady that came here and traded Manso to my great to my grandfather was Carlos Bono's great aunt. And so this guy sitting right here is, is almost a descendant of man. So Dr. Bono, we're proud to know you and proud to know that story about you. But the family, uh, the family moved forward in, in 1933. The family made the first sale internationally when they sent cattle to Australia. The, uh, we first showed at the Houston show in 1932 and have shown cattle there every year since. I'm told that they didn't go a couple of years during World War II. So we have a pretty good history with the hey, Houston Troy. Livestock Show. In all these years, we've sent cattle to 35 states of the United States and 43 countries of the world. And the ranch from those humble beginnings has now grown to be about 10,000 acres and about 1,800 mother cows all registered from it. So the wonderful thing about being in this business is to get to know and, and be friends with all of you and all the wonderful people that are involved with this great breed. So we welcome you here tonight. We hope you have a good time. If you have any questions, ask us. We don't really have any secrets around here. We'll tell you about anything. And if you come back, some of you have been here all afternoon. And uh, if you come back, we'll be happy to show you around too. So thank you all for being here. And I'll turn over the program to Gustavo Toro. He's right here behind me. Gustavo, thank you very much. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here to see all these friendly friends, hey, uh, friendly faces from all over the world. And uh, it's a dream come through to be able to present what we've been doing with all different breeds, but especially with Brahman cattle, 
about feed efficiency. So, one percent of you things that are pertinent to all of us, and either we like it or not, we cannot escape. And these are the forces that are shaping agriculture. It's a massive growth in food demand. They want it to be in with it. We have all the things of artificial intelligence and all these other technologies that are governing what we do. We have retail and packaging innovation. We have energy opportunities, convenient and health tech centers, uh, direct consumer producer. But I think the most important and the more relevant of what we are talking about is that we need to do it efficiently. This is how the industry is. Either we like it or not. And I saw this from Dr. Bill Meese when I was in a many years ago. He always thought that the beef industry was like the sand clock. We have all the producers and we have all the consumers. We have three packers that do everything. And every time these guys tell us more and more and more what they want. I remember taking a class in ANA many years ago and we were comparing the beef, the livestock industry, or the agricultural industry between the European Union and US. Back then they say that in Europe the customers rule. This class was probably 20 years ago. Back then we say that in US the retailers rule. I don't think that's like that anymore. With social media, with the amount of people that live in the city, with the impact and the voice they have, consumers rule. And either again, either we like it or not, they're gonna tell us how they want their food produced. This is a survey from Cargill. What the people see and what they are asking. What are the two most important things? That if their food is produced efficiently and is sustainable. This concept can be very broad and we can spend the rest of the night arguing what they mean. But that's what they want. And we better get in shape and we better produce it under those parameters or they're not going to buy it from us. So, we better get ready. There's a lot of people to feed. There's a lot less inputs to produce it. And there's a lot more pressure of how we need to produce those commodities or this food that we're going to produce. We are in a constant attack of, you guys see the social media? We are blamed because the global warming, because the cows fart and the rub and rub too much. And they're going to eventually tax us. Don't think that it's going to happen. Not going to happen. It's going to happen. I don't know when, but it's going to happen. And we better be ready and we better be working on it because if not, it's going to get us. Hey, Adrian. Hey, Chad. Well, the ones that don't do it are going to get, get it off guard. So, how we create a sustainable future? We produce more albums with less inputs and less environmental impact. This is the key. And once again, we're not going to escape from this. We've done it in the production per cow. I don't know how much you can see in the graph, but this is how the Pounds per milk are produced in the cows. It almost doubled from 2009 to 2018. This is the dressing percentage of the steers. We are producing every time more and more pounds of beef with less animals. So we are increasing productivity. But hey, I don't know we are doing efficient. This is an interesting graph, and I'm sorry to use dairy examples, but these are the ones that have more data. So, these are pounds of milk per cow, and these are footprints per cow for the pounds of milk produced. So, the more the cows produce with the less input or the same input, obviously, their footprints are less. And we need to get into that boat because it's not going to change. So, we need to produce more outputs with less inputs and less environmental inputs. I'll be at the show tomorrow. What's the goal? Producing more outputs, once again, with inputs and environmental impact. What's the solution? Feed efficiency. This sounds like rocket science to us. It sounds very new. The poultry and the hogs went through this 20 years ago. 
So it's doable, it's feasible. We have more challenge in the in the livestock side because of the generation interval and the way we produce. It's not as confined, but it's there and we better get on. So all these reasons are why we as a company are putting the amount of resources that we are putting into finding the animals that are going to make us fulfill those goals to have the right solution. Gustavo so Toro of ST Genetics, Genetics is talking. Many of you are familiar with that, in which we are measuring feed efficiency, our daily gain, carcass information, uh, and ultrasound and everything that BSC and all the other things that we can measure to find those animals. It's a 640 heads capacity facility, 10 pens of 32 heads. We are in the process of doubling the capacity in the back because we are testing beef on dairy calf from our sires and that's a completely different ballpark but it's, it's a ball that is non-stop. Hi Kat, hi Paula. What do we use to measure that efficiency? We use a concept called residual fit intake. What residual fit intake is the difference between the expected, in the actual intake and the expected intake. So we know that based on their body size and their target gain, the animals should eat eggs. The target gain in the GDC is 3.5 pounds a day. The animals usually come in about six, seven hundred pounds, so we know that they're going to eat 38 pounds of dry matter, of, of as fed, I'm sorry. If they eat more, they are inefficient. If they eat less, they are efficient. So if they eat more, they are undesirable. If they eat less, they are desirable. We can, tell, we can tell that residual feed intake was a concept invented by scientists because they made something that the more negative is better, which is a more difficult thing to explain. But that's how it is. They are expecting to eat X. If they eat less, they are efficient. If they eat more, they are inefficient. For our dairy sires, we came up with an index that we call the EcoFeed. So it's based on an index. If it's higher than 100, it's better. If it's less than 100, it's not as good. And that's how we are presenting that data everywhere. So, I don't want to get into this, but the interesting thing Ole is why residual feed intake is important. Because it's independent of performance body size, it's merely heritable, which means that we're going to make progress selecting for it. It's not related to growth and mature body size and have favorable effects on methane and emission. And, and uh, I, I heard from one of the geneticists when we get too many questions of why, and this, you don't question if it is. Believe that the scientists that have been dealing with this thing for 20 years have done a lot of paperwork to decide that RFI is probably the best tool that we have in our hands to select the animals that are more efficient. Here's where we get practical. I copied this graph from a presentation of Dr. Carstens that was a nutrition professor for many of us in this room. But basically remember this. This is what they were expecting to gain. This is what they were expecting to eat. So we want the animals that eat less and gain more. We want these guys. And now I'm going to show you some real numbers. This is the test that just finished. This is the summer 2019 test. We have animals from, what, six different breeds. We have Brahmins from ST Genetics, HK, and J.D. Hodgins, Guru Division. Look at these two animals. Remember the graph that I showed you, the four quadrants. Hey, Jason. This animal gained 4.18 pounds a day, very good but 5.83 pounds more than expected. We calculate an efficiency index, which is the relationship between these two numbers adjusted by age. Notice who the breeder is. I'm not hiding it. The numbers are the numbers. You cannot get pissed off with the computers. The computers throw numbers, and those are the numbers. We have some of the good ones too, but look this one. 
the pull from Michael. Average daily gain exactly the same. Residual feed intake minus 2.2. So average daily gain exactly the same. Eight pounds of feed a day difference. If you were only measuring average daily gain, you will say that these two animals did the same job. And you see that over and over and over, test behind the test. On every breed, as many as you want to see it. So that's why I want to present this data to you. We like to say that Brahman are more efficient. It's not true. There's animal of every quadrant in every breed. And if I have to say something, when you see data, some of the breed are more uniform. When we see data from Brahman, they are more scared. So, we are here all Brahman, and I don't want to say anything that is wrong, but that's the truth. And we have to select, and we have to measure in order to get uniformity, and in order to choose the animals that are giving up. So, a lot of you are very good Brahman breeders and knowledgeable. So, I'm going to show you two animals. And you're going to tell me which one is the most efficient of the two? Animal A? Animal B? Any guess? Hmm. Animal A? Animal B? Here are the numbers. Animal A? 789 pounds. 2.8 average daily gain. Animal B? 2.8 and where's the R5? Oh, here it is. Plus 4.3 minus 2.9. Again, 6, what? 7 point something pounds of feed a day different with exactly the same average daily day gain. Both look good. Both have good pedigree. I think they are both out of the same side, if I'm not wrong. I have to say something, this was the highest selling heifer in the lot, in the sale, so we're still not looking at that number. But there was somebody looking at that. So we better put selection pressure to know what it is. Number, I'm gonna show you dollars now in a little bit. These are 233 Brahman animals that have been doing the test since 2016. Uh, Mark has some bulls, Caballo Rojo has some bulls, HK has heifers, we have mostly heifers. Michael has been there in three different tests. So there are several breeders hey, involved Casey. in this database. The average of all those animals is 810 pounds. Average daily gain 2.52. Remember there's a lot of these are heifers because ST mainly tests heifers, but 2.52. Primary intake 22.9. <coughs> Let's go to the quadrant. This group gained 3.03, but eight less, 22.6. So 0.51 more pounds, minus 3.3 in intake. Here, 2.9 pounds more of intake, half a pound more of gain. Here, half a pound less of gain, plus 3.3 pounds, no, minus 3.3 pounds of intake. These are the killers. They have less gain and they eat more. <coughs> we were in a conversation the other day with the dairy group, and Juan Moreno, our CEO, said, it's probably more relevant to identify these guys quicker than the rest. Those are the ones that are killing the cash flow. So we have the favorable and unfavorable. This is not as bad. He's eating, well, this probably is, but these ones are eating and are gaining. These are the killers. You might want to have your cows in this group. They are not gaining that much, but they are easy fleshing, easy keeping. <coughs> now let's put the dollar sign in. This is estimating that the animals are going to be finished at 1350 pounds with a hundred and ninety eight dollar ton of ration, a dollars in ration per ton, and a 78 dry mat. So these guys will take 161 days to get finished and will consume 3300 pounds. That's going to cost you 462 dollars. 
next group. These guys will take six more days, almost the same, but they have 4,300 pounds, 931 pounds more of feet. So they're going to cost you $546, $84. Next group, 142 more days, 2,500 more pounds. $292 difference. And these are the keepers. 112 more days, 3,100 more pounds, $362 difference between this and the best group. So, if you guys don't think that there's an impact in your pocket, I think we are wrong. Let's see how this works. I've never done this before. These are the summer test results. If we don't think that all this is relevant, let's just think about advertising. Those are my years with you, Vicky. I learned a little. Average daily gain. This list is listed on average daily gain. Look how many brands show up. None, none, none. Nothing yet, right? Oops. Now let's list it by residual. Oops. Where are you? My residual feeding tape. Look who the third animal is. Brahma. Look what the fourth animal is. Look at the fifth, the sixth, the seventh. Then, then we have something to talk about. If you're in a conversation with a group of readers from any other different breeds and you talk about average daily gain, don't talk too much. If you talk about residual feed intake, now you have something to talk about. And then remember the index that we have that you have, that you have both things combined. Look. Third, fourth, fifth. They gain and they are efficient. They don't gain as much as the others, but they can do it efficiently. So guys, this is probably the best tool that we have, the best marketing tool that we have in our hands in a long time. Now, it's not free, it's not cheap, we need to measure. That's all I have for you guys. And we're going to ask Gustavo Toro if we can get that presentation from him. And we'll put it up on our website, guys, because we know you can't see the video. Thank you very um, much, Gustavo. The, the presentation you know, on the I'm screen. John Locke, and I am not going to talk very long, I promise, but I'm going to be talking to you about one of the most important things tonight, and that's how we're going to eat. So don't anybody get up just yet. Um, I want to thank our sponsors. That we have, we've got East Bernard Milling. East Bernard Milling provides us with our show ration as well as several other people that we know in the Brahmin business. They do a great job, they're big supporters of, of the industry in general and, and of J.D. Hudgens, and thank you for your support. And we also have Capital Farm Credit that's one of our sponsors, and we thank you guys for helping uh, with this program and helping to defray the cost of everything. So, I'm going to say a blessing here in a minute, and then afterwards, the way this is going to work, if you are a slacker and you sit in the back, congratulations, because you guys are going to eat first. And we're going to walk out the back of the barn, and we're going to go around. The tables and the food are going to be over here on the wash rack. So you guys are going to exit out the back, come all the way around and get your food, and we'll just kind of go in order from the back to the front. So if y'all will all... Remove your hats. I'm going to give thanks and then, then we're going to eat. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for everything that you have blessed us with. We thank you, Father, especially now for this great group of people that we have here. We thank you for the opportunity to gather here together and to fellowship. We thank you for this great breed of cattle that has brought us all together. And we ask that you would continue to bless all of us and and bless this breed and help us to come together and, and to do great things together. Father, we 
thank you for the freedoms that we have in this country, and we ask that you would be with our leadership and help us to retain those freedoms and help us to do things to glorify you and to be better in your eyes. Father, we thank you for the food that you've provided, for the hands that prepared it, and we ask that you bless that food to the nourishment of our bodies. In your son, in Jesus' name we pray. Okay, everybody, this is Victoria Lambert with the Brahmin Journal, and I'm here at the J.D. Hudgens uh, lovely dinner. And don't forget, we're going to be doing uh, live videos all week here at the national show in the United States. We had some people ask us to get the presentation, uh, and we will get that presentation from Gustavo Toro. He is with ST Genetics, and I'm sure that Gustavo will be more than happy to share that presentation with us. Since the video was a little bit, hi guys, ST Genetics, the video was a little hard for us to see um, on the screen, but I'll bet you that Gustavo, Gustavo, give us a wave. Thank you, that was a great presentation. I bet Gustavo will be more than happy to give us that a link to, and then we can send y'all to the genetic development center website and you can watch that presentation so we're going to get that all put together for you and if we don't have it by the end of this week we'll have it by monday on the brahmin journal website and on our facebook page so thanks for watching <laughs>